Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first session of Environmental Conscious Petroleum Engineering and a Roadmap for Sustainable Well Construction and Zero Emission course at Fire Petro. I hope all of you are doing well. My name is Rahima Babayeva, and I'm a graduate of University of Aberdeen. I have finished my Master of Science in Petroleum Engineering, and I am going to be your moderator for today's session on behalf of Arab Oil and Gas Academy. Today's webinar is going to be about safety first blowout preventer stack is not enough introducing a new barrier a casing ball valve by professor rafigal aval professor rafigal aval is the author of the leading chapter titled environmentally conscious petroleum engineering in the book of in the book environmentally conscious fossil fuel production john wiley uh, wiley 2010 he is currently located in lubbock west texas and served as a professor of petroleum engineering at the american university of ras al kalma in the united arab emirates uh emirates, emirates sorry <laughs> now <laughs> before starting today's session i'd like to mention that you can ask your questions from uh, question and answers part and three or five questions will be answered by professor rafigal aval let's welcome uh, professor rafigal aval uh, dr rafigal uh, we are delighted to be here today Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahima. And uh, I should say, good morning, world. I'm in Texas. It is beautiful morning. So good afternoon to many of you in the Middle East and the East. And uh, it's a beautiful day here. I hope you are enjoying also uh, your time at home or at work. And to begin with, I first want to say thank you to Pio Petro especially Dr. Ahmed al garahi who I believe without at the risk of flattering him, that he truly has established a world-class petroleum education system. And I'm glad to be part of it. And I also uh, uh, thank my uh, student Asma uh, uh, from American University of Ras al Khaimah in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Asma Shindi is now a graduate and is an active partner in Pio Petro and uh, Ara uh, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, beautiful initiatives, both of them. So with that, uh, I would like to begin my humble presentation, which is my, my vocation, which is environmentally conscious petroleum engineering. The, the, the journey began in 2010 on the left hand side when I was a faculty at Texas Tech University. And that year is very important in my life, a milestone for two reasons. One is, of course, being a chapter author, the chapter number one in this uh, book, Environmentally Conscious Fuel uh, uh, I mean Energy Production. It was actually by invitation from the Vice President of John Wiley Mr. Meyer Kurtz, who himself is a chemical engineer, and, and he had a mission sort of thing uh, uh, in this project. And uh, he invited many authors in different fields, in mining and other fields also. And I'm glad I was a part of that. And the other reason 2010 is important, <laughs> at the same time, I was doing my own pioneering research uh, to develop an environmentally conscious, or I'd say environmentally benign, or uh, to take uh, some kind of uh, a pride, environmentally better, you know, well uh, stimulation technique, which will be a mid presentation on the third day, I believe, which I called, I have given the name, plasma shockwave stimulation. So with that, now let me advance uh, one slide more. <clears throat> this uh, four-day program, you have it. And uh, we'll go to uh, first uh, uh, briefly on the contents of the chapters. The first chapter is mine, you know, and then comes uh, all chapters are important. So first, second, third is not important. It is what is inside. So you will see here that this book addresses carbon management, you know, uh, in oil, shale, oil sands, in which Canada is and Venezuela, they're number one in the world. And then comes second, coal mining. And ultimately, you see, number eight, we come, number eight is an integrated approach for carbon mitigation 
in the electric power generation sector. Aha, uh -huh. the electric power, that is the ultimate thing. Uh, the, nobody complains about electricity, and especially nowadays, if you have a choice to buy, to, uh, you are given a gift of a battery operated electric vehicle or a hydrogen fuel cell operated electric vehicle. Uh, probably myself, being a petroleum engineer, lifelong, since 1983, I go for either of them because it uses electricity. So now, what is my job as an energy professional and energy educator from the background of petroleum engineering that, and also mining engineering? I came from Indian School of Mines in India. Uh, so mines is there. So we can now think in a non-fossilized way. Somebody recently wrote in LinkedIn, that it is not that fossil fuel which is wrong. The wrong thing is our fossilized idea. We should use advanced idea. We should uh, ideas, we should break the wall between different disciplines of science and engineering and put our heads together. And we call it that thinking outside the box. And I will take you through this four days starting today that it is indeed possible, whether you are electrical in engineer, mining engineer, you are so-called you know, solar you know, PV, solar energy expert, or you are wind energy expert, or whatever it is, we should all come together and everybody contribute in an integrated manner. And this book, Fossil Energy Production, in essence, was an effort toward that. Coming to 2020, I'm glad that the whole world is now uh, voicing for this climate change, which basically starts with environment around us. We don't want oil spills. We don't want coal mine accidents, people dying, you know, and all sorts of things. And plus, we don't want the heating the warming that is going on all around us because of this carbon dioxide you know, and methane emissions. So I'm coming to that next slide. But at the very beginning, I need to give this disclaimer that this for the presentations you know, uh, in the form of short course is uh, a non-commercial effort uh, by Pure Petro. And all the materials I have used it some of the ideas are mine in terms of inventions, but the presentation materials I've gotten from the internet. So I owe a huge you know, obligation to acknowledge that. It's not possible to mention them all one by one. So I want to mention that at the very beginning. And the purpose of this whole discussion that is going on now, it is a share, it is, we wanna share our cleanest environment climate with shared ideas. So I'm talking, which means I have the first opportunity to share my ideas. But at the end of the day, I invite you to share your ideas. And uh, at the end of this, there will be a quiz uh, it will be sent to you. And I have carefully put one question, question number 20, the last one, which is the easiest one. Why? Because I'm asking that please let me know how we can make this exchange of ideas better through this uh, short course or whatever uh, presentations. And plus, you are most welcome to write me your critics about the ideas that you'll be listening, okay? So let us share the ideas and create a roadmap for sustainable energy engineering program. I am convinced, and I hope you'll be convinced, if not yet, uh, by end of today, or uh, by end of 4th of May, uh, God willing, that everyone has a part. We don't have to shut down the coal business. We don't have to shut down the oil and gas business. It is only we have to put one element there, non-fossilized ideas, in which your contribution will be as good as mine, I believe. So now, let us go a little bit back 1840, I've not shown any slide. 1840 is basically the time when 
the people in America at the time, in the beginning, I started looking for clean burning oil. And clean burning oil was there. It was the oil, blue, you know, uh, sperm whale fat, which uh, they used to use as an input to make a clean oil. And it burned, uh, you know, without any uh, smoke. So people use it. But that was a limited stock. So people started looking for alternative. So the mother of invention gave an idea to a couple of scientists who made, made ease of this dirty, gooey, crude petroleum, which was collecting on the surface to refine it and make kerosene oil. And kerosene oil was as good as the, you know, whale oil as a lamp or as an illumination uh, source. And fast forward to 1992, that that's a very important time because whatever we burn because of the inherent chemistry of combustion, it you know, from the carbon-based fuel, it produces carbon dioxide, this smoke, uh, which we don't see, of course. And this carbon dioxide, as we all know, is the source of the global warming and climate change. So I'll not talk about much more. So there is more than that, we have uh, also CS4, and the, this cartoon shows that the people responsible are not human beings, but sheep, and uh, all those kind of things, animals. Of course, we are also part of that. And there is something called this nitrous oxide, yeah. but uh, the focus is on uh, CO2 because it is burning coal, oil, and natural gas. So we can do something, we burn it in engines or in uh, uh, power generators, whatever. And CS4, although animals are shown, but uh, we know CS4 is one of the main sources of emissions uh, from the uh, carbon industry itself. And we can uh, use our non-fossilized, you know, world-breaking ideas to reduce, not only reduce, but to say the whole process of combustion. The fast forward, I would say, it is uh, uh, this stop sign is to indicate that stop doing business as usual. Do something for the sake of climate. And that means us, that means our future generations, our sons and daughters, our grandchildren, they should not blame us that our grandfather didn't do work. So that is the moral obligation. Coming fast for what, 2016, United Nations Paris Agreement. You all know about it. And I have put some one uh, link about there. If you click on that, you'll see a movie, okay? Uh, some, uh, somebody's giving the, what it means. The bottom line is that the governments are asked and governments are agreeing to take action on limiting CO2, okay? So we'll see. Now, government are not experts. They are decision makers. It is us, these engineers and scientists who have to develop the practical commercial methodologies so that the objective of cutting down CO2 emissions, methane emissions, nitrous oxide emissions can be reduced to the extent desired. And it has been set by this uh, uh, United Nations Framework Convention for climate change. Uh, after that, all those conventions are only, you know, tightening uh, the news around us that you're not doing enough. I'll show you, we can do lots of things. But first, as ordinary engineers, you and I, those of you who are not yet engineers, but petroleum engineer, student or mining engineer student, why we need to care about it? Of course, our personal interest is our career. And our career, especially in oil and gas, has been affected so far by pretty bad news, which is, you know, this frequent uh, mass layoffs in the oil industry. We know when there is an oil price crash, especially in the Western world, where the employers are companies, corporations, not government. So they lay off uh, in the national oil companies, which are owned by governments, it is much better. They don't lay off 
because they have responsibility to the government, you know. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. And then things is now coming, the probable <laughs> extinction. Uh, forgive me for this fearful expression, but I said probable if we do not take action. And I lay out the charter of actions. So as the world moves to clean energy, then and most of our jobs will disappear. This is the fear, but don't fear. I am here to bring hope because we can do better by rebranding ourselves. And this is very important. This is not a fantasy war. And you'll see it. The proof of the uh, pudding is in eating. You'll see it. I call it geoenergy engineers. So on day four, we'll explore the various pathways. Uh, for example, in oil and gas and mining, coal business and coal bed methane. We have blue hydrogen, we have geothermal, and last but not the least, and could be the main vehicle for mining and petroleum engineers to, to rebrand that we don't sell product that needs to be burned to produce CO2 and drive our cars and factories, but we can produce orange hydrogen. The orange hydrogen is my world. I have created it based on whatever I learned. It, this basically means orange hydrogen that instead of producing methane natural gas from reservoir or producing crude oil from reservoir, we can produce hydrogen right from the fossil fuel reservoirs, be it crude oil reservoir, be it natural gas reservoir in coal bed methane, or the coal industries, you know, the coals are at two levels. One is at the surface where you mine it, and then they go down uh, through large boreholes, they call shaft, they send people, and they go and dig and work in a very tough environment, you know, risking their lives. So we can put robots there, but if you go far deeper, you get even more people cannot go, but we can do coal gasification. And from this coal gasification, we can produce hydrogen. So all this come, will come under orange hydrogen. I cannot do it alone. Or the professors cannot do it alone. But the young engineers, you know, and the future engineers, you can do it. So we'll start the discussion on that. So geoenergy, I'm not the first one to, I created the word, but then I checked Google and I found, whoa, the University of Edinburgh in United Kingdom, uh, uh, Great Britain, they have this program, this is the MSc program, master's program. I looked at the program requirements, descriptions. It's as though we are thinking the same way, beautiful. So here is the proof that I'm not the only one. There are many people in the academia, especially that doing it and that started the geoenergy program. Okay. So here it is something you'll read it yourself. And let me go forward from here. So as you see, the geoenergy program looks for carbon capture and storage, which is nowadays in this year, you know, all the big oil companies, uh, shale oil company, uh, Royal Dutch shale oil company, and then BP, uh, they, they used to be called British Petroleum. Now they changed the name for BP, I don't know why, but BP, and then comes in this country, ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is the largest uh, uh, oil company in this country. But in terms of its reserves and size, it's not number one in the world. This is 17, uh, five years back. Number one is, I think, uh, Saudi Aramco, national oil company. And then this unconventional, conventional, you know, all this weight and dry geothermal heat, everything comes under everything, you know, under uh, geoenergy. Now look at those who are petroleum engineers. If you look at the geothermal, the geothermal is all about drilling. That is the only thing has stopped us from making geothermal widely commercial. Now, out of this tea, to wet and dry geothermal, the dry is most important because it is deep down in the basement rock, hot, uh, there's a uh, hot granite, uh, you know, uh, where there is no water. So you have to pump water and you have to fracture or create pathways so that the water goes inside and, and it, uh, gets hot enough and then reach maybe 100 meter away to another well through which it will come back to the surface as extremely superheated water and steam drive 
you know, turbines to generate electricity. It is very beautiful, like a fantastic tale, but there is a big barrier to that technology, which is drilling, how you can drill there. And even more than that, you can drill maybe two wells, which is not yet uh, that possible at that high temperature, except in a few places where it is shallow or not that hot, you know. So you have to create a pathways, fracturing. If you are thinking of hydraulic fracturing, uh, it sounds good, but it is difficult, very difficult for purely technical reasons. Anyway, US Department of Energy is investing now lots of R&D programs uh, right now on that. But uh, I'll, uh, so this is where you can make your bread and butter, your fame by solving those big problems in geothermal and in other aspects. Last step one, carbon capture and storage. This is the least you can do, but you only spend money. You don't earn money for that. So, but if you don't have technologies like orange hydrogen, then I believe you don't have to go to carbon capture and storage. So give me your opinion at the end of the day or the four days, uh, what you think about that. And this talks about the career. So what I mentioned about the two big threats about our jobs now and in future uh, as petroleum engineer, as a fossil fuel producers, mining or petroleum, whatever, you don't have to worry. You just give yourself a name, geoenergy, and prove that you can deliver hydrogen or whatever, but not something that we have been doing for the last 120 years, you know, for oil and gas and 300 or, or several hundred years since industrial revolution. Burn, 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 CO2, CO2, CO2. Actually, as a matter of fact, when in 1983, I passed from Indian School of Mines, now it is called Indian Institute of Technology, ISM, in Dhanbad, in 1983, I joined the Bombay Offshore Project, a humongous and successful offshore oil and gas engineering project by the National Oil Company of India, ONGC, Oil and National Gas Commission at the time, now this changed commission to corporation, it remains the same. And I found, I was flown by helicopter in that uh, international orange color, uh, uh, this overhaul. And I saw from helicopter, and a huge, I thought, get a blow somewhere, big plume of fire. <coughs> and then I was told when I landed on the helipad, helideck, and it was around one kilometer away, but it is so hot even from one kilometer away. And today I'll show you in this case that that is not less than a gas will blow up. But then I said, why do you do it? They said, we produce around 600,000 barrels of oil. It comes with gas, which we call associate gas. And this gas, you know, we have a pipeline only 20 inches diameter. So it doesn't have the capacity to take uh, uh, through that uh, 150 kilometers long pipeline to onshore uh, facilities. So we burn it. I said, you could make it quite 20. You could make it 40. And I was told economics. <coughs> By the way, that economics is a fossilized idea. I know if you can make use of it, <coughs> then we don't have to burn it. And all over the countries, they flare it. But from 1992, they have stopped flaring because of government pressures. And this is a good sign, and we can do much more from here. So let me go and the, uh, to the agenda. And to this agenda is, of course, the, uh, the first one, which is safety first, blood preventer uh, stack is not enough. So that is my first study along the journey on the roadmap for long drive for geoenergy. So geoenergy, you can remain petroleum engineer with some modification in the curriculum. You can remain mining engineer <coughs> with some modification in your curriculum. Discard those things which are just past. Okay, don't have a hangover with that. For example, the other day, Professor Sayed Farooq Ali from University of Houston now, but he spent his all life in University of Calgary, contributing immensely to the science and engineering of thermal oil recovery. And that can be now rebranded into what I call in-situ conversion of hydrocarbons into uh, uh, hydrogen. 
and this is not a dream. A field demonstration project has started with one professor, uh, Ian Gates, from the same University of Calgary, and I'm now uh, in contact with him. Uh, they have uh, done several years of intense R&D work proving the concept, and they have started the field trial from the heavy oil and a deep uh, reservoir heavy oil in Canada, or even from surface, will convert into uh, hydrogen, okay? Uh, that's the beginning. And what I, why I mentioned uh, Professor Seth Harugali, in his presentation in, uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, he mentioned about this chemical EOR. He said, it is good for publishing paper, getting government money or commerce money for research, but if you want to implement it, make money, forget it. And I said, wow, thank you, Professor, for telling this bare truth. And he has the credential to say that. And I'm sharing this with all professors in US universities, with those who have written book on chemical UR. So forget it, better turn your attention on thermal oil recovery because there's lots of similarity. Only thing we have to change midway thermal oil recovery, don't recover oil, convert them into hydrogen. Bingo. And the second day, I'll talk about sustained casting pressure. This has become very serious because the methane that animals are planned for, actually, we are number one culprit from the oil and gas industry. Unknowingly or unknowingly, it goes through leaks from the wells, from the pipelines, from the factories, of the compressors, everywhere, CS4, CS4, CS4. And this CS4 is much worse than CO2 by in terms of its radiative uh, power, it mean, means heating power of the atmosphere, uh, somewhere from 40 to 70 times. So <coughs> that is very important. Day number three, I'll come. This is my prize, fracking and acidizing. Can't we innovate something better? This is the most you know, intriguing thing. Why would we go fracking, which was invented by accident in 1947, and go and make it work like a giant demon, you know, to fix up the art and create so much problem? Yes, if you want to get the oil, maybe you don't have to fracture it that, that much. You just make use of smart shock waves to make clinical fractures in a very controlled manner and for a very short period of time, not for a long time, you know, and humongous pressure. So we'll talk about that. And the final day, I'll and I put all these things together to create what I call rebranding petroleum engineering into, you know, a new portfolio that's from hydrocarbon to hydrogen. Remember, in 1840, we started from hydrocarbon to kerosene, and then came hydrocarbon to diesel, and hydrocarbon to gasoline, hydrocarbon to this, 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 and petrochemicals. Petrochemicals are fine, as long as we are responsible uh, in using and disposing of plastics. But the fuel part, which is 90% of the oil and that we produce in the world, you know, which is around 100 million barrel per day, so 90 million barrel that gets burned into carbon dioxide. So that has to stop while we are putting our shoes in petroleum or mining engineering. It's possible, it's integrated, uh, can be integrated with other energy engineering branches uh, in a nice sort of global asset team that where everyone will work together and under the sign of zero energy. So with that, let me go back uh, to this to this topic, which is uh, well controlled after blowout. So my question here is, are we safe today, even in the United States, from blowout? Blowout happened, the most ferocious one first recorded was in 1901 in Texas, my home state here in the United States of America. And it was controlled. But is it a matter of past? Or, is it or does it happen like it happened last year in June in Eastern India, Assam, you know, and it continued for 174 days. 
you know, evicting thousands of people because it was in densely located villages. So is it because it happens in other countries? So no. Blowout is something that can go wrong and happen because of human errors. And humans are humans. And that could be a thousand reasons. So I'll give you some examples first and then invite your attention that do we have to sit idle with hands like this and say, oh, oh my God, what is going on there? Yes, for a common man, it makes sense to cry out and express anguish. But as a petroleum engineer, we don't have any justification. And more importantly, there's no use in blaming why this happened. There could be a thousand reasons. But the point should be, and that's what I call, don't fossilize your brain. You learn, you are you know, forced to learn something in the academia for a degree. The company is forcing, here are the best practices, but best practices are everywhere, in any oil companies, in any companies. But then this happens. And when this happens, then the petroleum engineers should be the first to answer a simple solution. So you may say, why? This is what, you know, to the Macondo world, 2010, in the Gulf of Mexico. On the third day, and this happened because, of, I mean, from the world, Macondo world, it did, does not belong to any third world country. It belongs to America and the biggest oil company in the world, British Petroleum. On the third day, myself and many professors from U.S. Petroleum Engineering Departments they were in BP headquarters in the energy corridor of Houston by invitation. And on the third day, of course, when they invited, they did know they invited a month ago and uh, just uh, to take part in offshore, this uh, the OTC, Offshore Technology Conference. Uh, so we are guests. And on 10th of May, it happened. And on 13th, we are there. And we have, were received by the first president of research of British Petroleum. So we met around 30, you know, petroleum engineering professors, me, Dr. Heinji from Texas Tech University and from many universities. And they gave us a presentation, the vice, and I'm, this is on record. And I, at the end, I'm, I asked that you talked about your new building, how energy efficient new building, headquarter building is there. But you are not asking the cream of uh, the petroleum engineers that what sort of help we can offer you. And he kept quiet hey, and he just smiled at me. And that is some big shock that happened in 2010. But, and then at that time, I was doing research uh, about this plasma shock wave. And I was writing this uh, chapter on this. So remember this. But here the point is not uh, aiming British Petroleum, you know, who has this kind of uh, uh, blood, or this is the one over here in, in Oklahoma, uh, in the Pittsburgh County in, in Oklahoma, where I did my PhD, and this is in 2018, see? And you have to see more. So this is the Oklahoma, you know, after this, five people were killed because of the explosion there, folks blew out, and then here is a JPT Cabaret's on that, uh, you know, both uh, uh, after the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, CSB, you know, they published the reports on both Macondo and Oklahoma. They said it is the human. I said, look, there is no, and of course, this is from Eastern Europe, 2018. So there is no gain. We don't make the bad world better by blaming the you know, people. Give me one good solution. Okay, granted. This fire is burning. How we can stop it? They say, call the daredevils. Call Red Adair. The daredevil Red Adair, you know. And, uh, and Red Adair's bill was, uh, you know, uh, one million dollar party to douse, to stop, to tap the well in Sagar because in ONDC, I was a, a junior student at Indian Institute of Mines. And our chairman was very dynamic. He's, he was in touch with the ONDC, you know, that uh, National Oil Company Authority. And he used to tell us every day what is going on. He said, you know, $1 million, India could not pay. 
At the time, Indian Prime Minister was traveling on official business in the U.S. and the U.S. President volunteered that we'll pay and we'll say, send our daredevil Red Adair and his team. And job done. In 30 days, they kept it. The next year, I was appointed engineer, well completion engineer you know, in offshore. So I saw that well in that platform. Oh my God. I said, the whole, the best Jacob rig, it owned the safety, uh, safety award that year. And within one month, it collapsed $30 million, uh, the price of the Jacob rig gone. And the cost uh, for another $30 million, of course, it was paid by uh, the US government. And the cost of the rig was paid by the insurance company, you know, so they got it back. But the question is, is that the solution? That is not the solution. We have to, we have forgotten one thing and I'll show you what is that small thing that we have forgotten. So let us ask this question ourselves. Why can't we cap the blowing well? On the same day, within a few minutes, is it possible? Some of you say, Professor Awal has gone nuts. I cannot hear your voice because uh, only you can hear my voice, but I'll convince you by showing something, watch this. I hope it works. And I have put many videos, but this is the only video I insist you to watch because here is the answer to that billion dollar question. Come on, Bismillah. So, okay, look what is happening. I shut my mouth. Dr. Rafigul, I think we have a problem. We cannot see a video. Uh, I hear someone is uh, saying, uh, if you cannot see this, don't worry. It is in the PowerPoint, which will be given to you uh, later on. You can watch. But those of you, if you can see, uh, and I will tell you at the end what I found. And there is the whole story about. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Dr. Rafigul, I, my, um, I'm Rahima, but uh, our attendee is also writing that they cannot uh, see. Okay, let me close it because I cannot hear you. Uh, okay, please repeat the question. I'm sorry, uh, I cannot see. Also, our attendees are writing that they cannot see the video. Okay, then I'll stop it. Thank you very much. So what I'll do now, I'll give you the solution, what I saw from here. So let me go to my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so I have watched this and I'll show you that this securities, this crew, it was a blowing well at the very beginning. It was, suppose it was a gas cap, the gas uh, kick. So gas coming, gas influx from the reservoir and coming into the well and the mud density wasn't enough. So the hydrostatic pressure generated by the mud column, you know, thousands of feet maybe, uh, from surface all the way to the reservoir. And uh, uh, so it was not enough. It was supposed to be more than the formation pressure in which the gas or oil is contained. So it was pushing the mud first, so maybe 500 barrel, that mud was coming out. So it was safe. So if gas is coming out, oil is coming out uncontrolled, we don't try anything because uh, there is a safety protocol, safety first. You run away from there. You don't do, but you have time. So I have given you a question in the quiz that shows that it takes, you know, for the given, as I said, maybe you have 30 minutes at hand and it is mud coming out. So you have a device, they call it over here, that drill pipe, here is a drill pipe safety valve. This is hardly two feet long. You just put it on the drill pipe, mount it, okay, and then close it. Finish your will is kept. So if you don't do that, 
run away because you, you were scared or you will lose your mental composure and then oil and get gas starts coming out and then rest is of course you know huge thing that those destructions then it is gone but now if this ball valve it's a ball valve you know it's been there right from the beginning but what happens you know if the drilling string is not there if there is no drilling string you have closed the annular for example you know uh uh, preventer in the BOP, in the blowout preventer stack, you have used it, closed it, but then the, so there's nothing coming through the casing around the drill pipe, but if you don't put this ball valve immediately, uh, close it, it takes just a second to close it, quarter turn, then this blowout will continue and oil and gas will come out and catch fire, you know, or whatever. Uh, so this is your chance. So my question is that if we could put this valve, you know, design in the casing also, what we call it, the casing drilling, uh, casing septic, uh, so, sorry, drilling pipe septic valve. Okay, besides drilling pipe in the olden times, we had a square shaped pipe called Kelly. In the Kelly top part and bottom part, they put a similar valve. They call it upper Kelly cock and lower Kelly cock. Same thing, ball valve to control. And so the idea here is why can't we put a casing ball valve in the casing immediately? Okay, in the pine hole. It could be a surface casing if you're dealing <coughs> beyond the surface casing. It could be an intermediate casing or it could be the last one, which is the production casing. Uh, okay, so if it happens, okay, during drilling, when the production casing has been set, because you have risked the reservoir oil uh, or gas, and then for some reason, there could be thousands of reasons why it may happen, then the blowout may happen. So you still have the uh, blowout preventer, okay, on uh, at the wellhead, and then when the rig is there, so if the blowout preventer fails <clears throat> and the blowout starts and it throws away the drill pipe, everything, but you have seen from the previous slide in Eastern Europe or everywhere that the casing pipe remains. So why don't you put a casing ball valve there? I could hear Rahima, do you, do, do you hear uh, from audience? Wow. I would expect a wow here. Why we could not think it? So let me proceed. So casing ball valve. Now, Professor Awal, if it is that easy, they would have done it in America or in England. That's a wrong idea. I'm talking after teaching in Texas Tech University. I got educated my PhD from US. And at one point when I was a research engineer, somewhere in the world for many years, and I developed an idea uh, and my manager liked it. And he went to the national oil company to fund the project. They just dropped this idea. He said, if what Dr. Awal is talking about is true, why didn't, why they didn't do it in America? And he said, the manager, and he apologized to me, so I understand. I said, I also understand. So I'm planning to go to America and I have worked here and I'll do that. And that thing I have done is plasma shockwave fracturing. So we sh we sh that's a fossilized idea. Oh, no, 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 no. If it is possible, they have must have done. No, no. The apple was falling on many people's head, but when one apple fell on Sir Isaac Newton, the concept of gravity and acceleration and all these mechanics and calculus, you know, all these things came into thing. We know it. So let us free ourselves from that uh, mindset and see what we can do further. <clears throat> now, this is a real industrial, you know, uh, ball valve under high pressure, 10,000 psi, no problem. Full bore. This is a full bore. So suppose this part goes to the casing, the casing will have an ID. So this will have the same ID, okay? See all these things familiar? All right. 
So they use it on the surface, pipelines. So one smart idea, why don't we put in the production casing when it is, uh, we are doing production casing or when we are installing the surface casing and to continue drilling, we put the heavy blow preventer on top of that uh, 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 surface casing head. Why don't you adjust below that this valve? Okay, because this, when the BOP fails, and you have seen again and again, it is a maintenance problem of BOP. It is so complex and huge for maintenance that it doesn't work when you need it. But the simple looking, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, this, uh, so you can go right over here. See, this is a, a well head. This is the casing hanger. So this is the casing spool, okay? Right over here, uh, uh, you know, during drilling, they'll put a BOP. I said, wait, before you put a BOP, you just put over here. This is the tubing spool, you know, it will come when you finish it. Just put that one over here, okay? And you can see on the right-hand side, so this is the BOP and right, will be, I'm not showing here, uh, over here, because these are from uh, drilling formulas website, Okay, so I'm only showing this arrow. Put it there. And when there is fire, whatever it is, you are waiting for, I'm sorry, Red Adair is dead. He died in 2004. And now in Eastern India, when it, it happened, they had a few experts from Canada, okay, uh, for disaster control experts. But I tell you, think about it. If there was this valve, the BOP was there, not working or under maintenance, you could just close this up like those in the video that you will see, I wanted you to see for that reason, they put a ball valve and close the well and prevent the ultimate uncontrolled flow of oil and gas. This is as simple as that. And you can do it. I'm not going to patent it because to go into the oil and gas industry, it is better it goes through some big companies who have you know, the, uh, their, their, uh, the facilities to develop it quickly. And so I mentioned OEM, original equipment manufacturers like Cameron, Weatherford, Baker Hughes, you know, I don't know if uh, there is uh, uh, other companies. So whoever, or you can, Make your own small company nowadays, get some uh, fund from somewhere, from some capitalist, and get a startup company, <coughs> develop it, meet the requirements of API, okay, 6A or whatever, and bingo, you're good to go, business. And this big, um, big, big oil companies will come to take the license for it or buy out your company. That's a business as usual, okay? So you can ask me, why didn't you do it? I said, I tried, but the venture capitalist who came to me several times, not only for this, for this plasma, and before that plasma, I had another invention, and they came. I said, I don't like your terms and conditions. They said, we make you the thing uh, like this. But I know you will ask me after two years, what is the return? This will take around five years or 10 you know, uh, at least to go through all the you know, testing and getting the certification. Can you wait? And so maybe you have a better business idea, so I'm leaving it to you. So this big idea, which I have just presented to you, ladies and gentlemen, especially young engineers, you know, uh, it is, uh, if you compare with the state of the arts, okay, the, the blowout preventers. So what I have done, I've created a call casing ESD. ESD means uh, emergency shutdown valve, okay? It is just like a lifeboat hanging from a big ship. See those lifeboats? Like the Titanics, remember? The beautiful song, but the life was not that beautiful. The people, those who survived, they survived because of the small boats. So some people will say from you know another era, Hey, you fool, why you put those small, 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 small boats when you have the big boat? 
to save life, to save property. And that is the underpin of what is I suggested, I'm suggesting uh, discussing emergency shutdown valve, okay? This is at the surface. And why I call it emergency shutdown? This can go also downhole, I'll tell you, you know, and at that point, uh, I mentioned other thing, emergency defibrillator in a shopping mall, airport, you see some person has suddenly collapsed because of heart, you know, cardiac arrest. So even it is made in such a simple way, anyone can take it and if why starts behind, do this, do this, do this, bingo, it means to work up, it, okay? So it is, you can imagine that way. The Dr. Awal has uh, given us the idea of casting emergency heart bulb. The cynical say, oh, no. how come they didn't do it in America or in, in England or in Germany? You don't have to think like that. It will save life and lots of, you know, this is for dollar, dollar, dollar. I call it trillion dollar, million, billion, and trillion. And you keep on counting. And most of all, it is environment. So what I'm talking about, it makes perfect sense. When I say that environmentally conscious petroleum engineering is here to stay if we care, if we don't think like the fossilized ideas. Here it is my tribute with Abdul Jawad. Do you know Abdul Jawad? And I should have asked her this question in the quiz that if you don't know Abdul Jawad, you are not good enough. You should know Abdul Jawad. And here is Abdul Jawad. <coughs> when he did, and the sheep, evergreen or ever whatever, doesn't matter, got, you know, and said, well, that many people came forward. I did it, I did it, I did it. But this is the real hero, and he is not paid yet for his extra hard work for those seven days or 10 days only three hours a day he used to sleep and what he and his team. I wish I had uh, several million dollars. I would give half of that to him. Okay? So if you uh, make millions from these ideas, respect him. Dawad deserves the thanks and standing ovation for, from all the world. And I mean it at age 62. But he's the only one who is standing. So he's on and now I'm standing. Please forgive me. For Abdul Jawad. Not only this, I have something more for him. Uh, I have something to that birthday whistle, and I, I don't find it nearby. So the birthday for him. All right, let us proceed. <clears throat> Now, here is another, Exxon Caps leaking Ohio gas well. That was in 2018 again, okay? So this 100 million cubic feet per day of methane gas, remember methane? They blame cows and animals that they uh, make shit and it contains CS4. But look what is happening. 100 million cubic feet per day, can you imagine? Now, again, I'm not blaming and an action mobile. If it is your well, it will do the same thing. It doesn't know who is the owner. But our attention should be not to blame anybody. The blame for not doing the things they could do. And now that we are coming with the new casing emergency shutdown, and I'll show you how it is possible, then there is no reason for them to follow it up. But you have to do in a business way, as I mentioned. Start your company, you patent it. I am not going to, I'm not interested. I have four children, three are MDs, one son, he's a lawyer, you know, doctor, jurisprudence, and uh, and I want to pass it to you. So, And they are not interested to get, you know, the money which I make my patent. I said, no, you keep it. your invention. I said, oh, better, I keep it the world. I said, oh, that's even better. That's what I'm doing. So, when I was, remember, at the Bombay High Offshore Project, as a freshly minted petroleum engineer, well completion engineer, I completed more than a dozen wells with my team. It's a teamwork, always team, team, team. Whether you're a team leader or a follower, doesn't matter. And it's just like the five fingers. All are important. Okay? So I learned that called surface control, 
subsurfaceceptival sc hyphen s s s v so because that was mean for the tubing strings 500 feet plus minus below the uh, kelly bush which means you know the well head you put that emergency shutdown system in case something goes wrong like for example in the, whatever you call it kuwait oil well fires hundreds of them why they are burning because somebody put explosive for whatever reason that is none of our business but why they were on fire when the well head was blown away you can tell those guys they did not put sub surface safety valve how much is cost sub surface safety valve you know it we teach in the classroom maybe a few thousand and what happened after that okay so that is put only when the oil is completed as production casing to run the tubing string with packer with christmas tree and Christmas tree has two master gate valves uh, as the barrier to any accident. But then you, what happens if the storm or typhoon or some saboteur, some saboteur or some defeated army, they blow away the wheelhead, the master valve is gone, it will keep on flowing. But if the subsurface safety valve is attached with the tubing string, and it is safe 500 to 1,000 feet below the ground level. Nobody can just say that. That the moment the surface oil head is gone, it stops. This is called fail safe operation. Now I put this seal for casing. Casing string. Let's say it is completed well. So we'll have one in the tubing string Surface, surface control, subsurface safety valve, and that will be in the production casing. And I'll show you where. Okay, so subsurface control, subsurface casing, safety valve. So one of my quiz questions is there that I searched Google, I didn't find anywhere this system. So Maybe I am the first one to think and also to design that. I don't have to design it. It is already designed and it is proven. I have installed it. You have installed it, those of you who are well combustion engineers. Okay. But don't ask this Texas or this Oklahoma you know, operator. There are thousands of small, medium sized companies. They save money, they cut corners, they may not use it. But we know any responsible oil company. They'll go for it. They will not save a few hundred dollars, few thousand dollars, you know, to ultimately pay like British Petroleum or BP did by changing your name. You don't, cannot uh, uh, change your identity that you are British Petroleum. Thirty billion dollars fine was left by the U.S. government agency for their negligence. I said thirty billion is not enough, but they put it less so that we can survive and do better work uh, in future. Hopefully they or all companies will do. But here is the idea, surface control. It is same, only the valve will be a little bigger. So I'll show you. So where and how, okay? So there are two designs. One is for production casing and the other one is for surface and intermediate casings. Both are possible. So this is the one first, this is the usual one. This paper is there, you have time to see it. Very simple, very simple, just like opening and closing a door. Believe me, only you don't push it with hand. There is a hydraulic line. Uh, this will be located in the tubing, okay? Or uh, now, it, hopefully it will be also introduced in the casing, uh, just below the tubing string in the production casing, as simple as that. This hydraulic line carries a pressure, okay? To enough to open this valve. Now valve is open. Now if the bomb or the whatever it is for a storm or a, a truck knocks up the wellhead, the Christmas tree, this line at the surface will be broken and the pressure will be gone. And as soon as the pressure is lost, 
this valve will close by spring action. See, so humble. It's just like the apple falling on Newton's head, right? So inside a surface control, which means the hydraulically controlled from surface, sub-surface casing safety valve in the cap rock. Cap rock means impermeable shell rock above the oil reservoir, okay? And the tubing shoe should be about 20 to 50 feet above that valve. So that passes is unobstructed. The casing part below the tubing shoe, okay, 20 to 50 feet, is still just the whole uh, inside uh, flow area of the production casing, okay? You put there. So what is good for goose is good for gander. Means if you can eat rice, I can eat too, right? Or if you, if you can eat um, uh, um Ali, I can too. All right. So the same thing. So it will work. And so this is one type of flavor, just like over here. But then also I suggest another thing called the ball valve. The type ball valve, hydraulic line pressure keeps the flavor in open or the ball in open condition. <laughs> so I again started looking for this uh, uh, Google, if somebody has done it. I found the backer who has, has come close to it, but again for the tubing not for the casing. So this is uh, much more elegant, okay? And it gives a full bore access. So all they have to do, uh, they have to uh, just make it for the casing. The casing, tubing, they are all got oil filled tubulars. They are tubulars. Them is just, for example, your name is Asma or Rahima or Ahmed, and my name is Rafiq, but same human being, right? So it works everywhere. So last week I found it and I and they have a link that contact us for information. So I filled out the form and sent to them and no response because they think I cannot buy it. So why talk to them? Then I found one backer who's an engineer. He made a presentation on Pio Petro last year, I think. And uh, he's on my uh, network and LinkedIn. I requested him, uh, but uh, I think he has obligation, you know, or if I want to buy it, he can give it. But if uh, I don't buy it, if your company doesn't give, he cannot give. But I'm telling you why, because you go ahead. Maybe now they will, if they make it now after uh, one year, so year, and they'll patent it, of course, it is business practice as well, I'm nothing to say. But if you can beat them, Becker who's this, or Weatherford, or Cameron, I'll be the heaviest, whether you are in India, you are in Egypt, and uh, you are in Iraq, or you are in China, in Indonesia, or America. And please let me know if you and if you ask any more help. You know, I'll ask Dr. Ahmed to give my email to you. Contact. I'll help you every way, free. But I want you, like a coach, to win this race. Okay, and I'll be very happy if you can beat these big guys. And of course. Once you do it, and then you start a small company, they will buy it. Or at least you can go to Mark Zuckerberg. He'll buy it for several billion dollars, okay? So, but do it, okay? And you don't have to pay me. So the other uh, locations I talked about, this is the production casing. So if the tubing is ended here, you know, I put something, I think it, it got lost, you know. So the tubing should uh, be ending over here. So, so below, this is the production casing. You put that surface controls, you know, soft surface casing valve over here. That will do. But blowout doesn't happen only in the final stage. It can happen. The first one is uh, your, I think, conductor casing in this, and the second one is surface casing. And you're dealing at a shallow, high pressure gas pocket. It can get blowout, especially offshore, and in, uh, surface, you know, even while drilling through uh, the surface uh, casing that protects the groundwater, you are a couple of thousand feet below. And still, you have to go in another 5,000 feet to reach the oil and gas. But there was something, another high pressure you know, gas reservoir, which a you know, you know, geologist could not tell you as a surprise and create the blowout. So, you can put that system there also. 
Suppose you put that over here, you know, and then comes production casing. No problem, the production casing will pass through that ball valve or clipper valve, and you put cement, it remains there, no problem. Only a few thousand dollars. Don't be any wise pound foolish. Don't pay 30 billion dollars, okay? As simple as that. So this is my message to you guys. I'm not telling those big guys in big companies, they are like old dogs who you can teach a new trick. But if you do it young, you're young and energetic, then, and improve it, they'll come, okay? I tell you one story. When I was teaching at Texas Tech, the shell boom, you know? Nobody believed in Robert Mitchell, a petroleum engineer of 1960, you know, from Texas A&M University. At the age of uh, at, uh, 92, in 1985, he developed this shale fracking idea. I'm cutting short. And he spent his money for 10 years until he could make commercial amount of gas coming out. During that time, his engineers were coming at him. And Mr. Mitchell, why you are, you know, from shale making commercial gas? It is impossible, don't you know? Shell doesn't have permeability. He said, guys, that's why I'm fracking it. And I need a magic fracking. He spent hundreds of thousands, asked Houston big companies to develop big pumps so that it can deliver 20,000 pounds per square inch and pump and hide it and frack it. It took him 10 years. And then in, in 1995, uh, he made success. He could sell the gas. And after five years, the Devon Energy came that we want to buy the shale because in US, the oil and gas, everything under our belongs not to the government, to the people. It's your land, it's yours. <coughs> so he knew it, it will work. Patience, suffer, patience, patience, it works. And he went even bankrupt almost to the point. And then he worked, but before hand, he made sure he owned all those Dallas area, they could burn a shell, all those land for mineral rights, he put it, you know? So when he started making money, oh, me too, me too. But everything is locked. These properties are in the hand of Mr. Michel, Robert Michel, petroleum engineer, okay? I call him son of a gun, all right? The tall Texan, six feet, father of eight children, no problem. And he did it. And he said, well, how much are you going to pay? Yes, they paid him $2 billion. And from next day, he writes, our people, journalists, oh, billionaire Michel, billionaire Michel, okay? So I'm telling you, and some of my students who are now engineers in drilling field, they meet me at the airport, Professor Award, they come. I said, who are you? you? Remember, I was a student in 2009, 2010, 11, 12. Uh, you talked about Robert Michel? Yes. And one of them, one that he said, oh, he has died. So again, my tributes to him, but not too much because uh, of the bad name of fracking, you know? And uh, at the time I was trying to uh, uh, throw the Texas Tech University's uh, business school to sell this idea that we are the university, Texas State University, you know, like the uh, University of Texas Austin, number one, and then of course, uh, Texas A&M University. And then we have uh, several other, and we are one of them. And so uh, the business professors, you know, they knew, they said, we know there are some 20 billionaires uh, in, uh, in the Parmian Basin, West Texas, where I'm from. And at the time, the news report showed that Texas Tech West, uh, Texas was making Three billion dollars per month from shale resources. So they came up with an answer after some time. Uh, so I gave them their, uh, the MB students prepared a nice SWOT analysis, S W O T. You know, strength uh, your then the, what do you call uh, uh, S W O T? Strength, weakness, and then O opportunity. Threat. And they gave a thumbs up. Wow, this is this will be a <laughs> paradigm you know, shift, you know, uh, disruptive technology, blah, 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 blah. Of course, I know it. But they came up with the answer. 
He said, look, we are making it billions. We don't have enough place to keep the money. And he was suggesting something called green technology, and it will cost only a few hundred thousand dollars to, you know, just to pay, you know, three million dollars per well for fracking with water and profit. And this professor says it will cost only maybe hundred thousand dollars, not even a million. Hey, keep the change. We don't need it. Okay. I'm telling you because this is official. All right. So go ahead. Now I'm coming to the last part uh, about it. Title is Benefits of This Idea, which I'm giving to you, and I'll give more if you're serious. We make a business out of it. Surface control, sub surface, casing, shut, huh? safety valve. Then look at this one. This is the one actually which made me cry. It happened in the year of COVID from May 27 to November 15. <clears throat> People are watching, not for fun, because the fire spread all about these jungle areas, that temperature, which reminded me of those flare points in Bombay High. You know, if I play the video, the sound is the same. If the amount coming over here, it will not be less than 500 million cubic feet per day, okay? One of the best, maybe, gas producing well in Saudi Arabia and gas field like that, because it is uncontrolled. There is no choke, nothing, of course. At the bottom, you'll see the pressing pipe is still there. So if you take my ideas, which is a redundant system, you can put a small, nice, you know, uh, 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 that's casing valve below the, uh, you know, on top of the production casing, and better yet at the uh, below, <clears throat> and the below is even better. Do you know why? Because the gas will be stuck right above the reservoir. Suppose that ball doesn't work, then I have the surface. Okay? The surface, small casing ball, remember that? So it is a double protection. So this is what a petroleum engineer should have done. But we are trained in schools where the ideas are fossilized. You don't go and tell them what you want to learn. You take this problem to any professor. Why you could not think like this? Don't blame them. Everyone has brain. But the day where we train, we make people intellectual slips. In the academia, students, oh, if you go against me, you lose points. In the industry, oh, that is not the company policy. You do your job. Okay? And I heard it. My first job, and then I resigned from that when this is, you know, I had to complete the well and then flow it back through a burner. Of course, I didn't complain about the burner, okay, to flare it. But I, I used to do acid job, you know, acidizing, 15% uh, hydrochloric acid, okay? We pump it and keep it for six hours. It was carbonate reservoir, and then we flow it. But the acid is only limited amount it goes whatever we calculate just to do its chemistry in the carbon rock and the rest in the tubing string. We do it after putting the tubing string and packer. Tubing string is, and also the annulus is filled with diesel. 500 barrels of diesel fuel. <coughs> and when you open it through the surface temporary line from the iron line or ticks and joints to the flare point, it's flowing only diesel which is burn, of course. And I told one of my super engineers, why do we, we know how much we have injected and that diesel is not in the formation, in the tubing, okay? The tubing part only. So why don't you first catch it? We have the huge drum, which we use for acid preparation, okay? So we keep it there, we filter it through 500 micron mesh filter and we reuse it Instead of saying, wow, that sounds a good idea, he said, stop it. You don't have authoriza authorization, you know. So I'm telling it to you because, believe it or not, I have come through the same grinding machines in academia. And also, so as my role as an educator professor, I try always to encourage my students, talk to me, give your ideas, bring in. And I used to shy away from those 
topics or chapters which is unnecessary there. And people make fine, beautiful PowerPoint slides, lots of color. I said, don't waste the mind of the students. Trash them out. So I'm going to write a new book called Well Construction Engineering, where everything will be put, okay, in a way that it just messes well with the rebranding of the profession as energy engineers. It's not only a mining engineer who is involved in coal industry, who is producing coal, you know, he's also an energy engineer. I'm also a petrol energy engineer, electrical engineer, engineering, let's say green or whatever, you know, electricity. They're all energy engineers. And my book will show, I'll just like the 2010 book, uh, all the credit goes to Mr. Meyer Goods, the vice president of John Wiley, for doing that. I admire him now at that time, but now more, because the whole world wants that kind of approach, and it is going to keep your jobs and not at the whim of the big oil companies in the Western world who lay off thousands of people mercilessly because of politically motivated oil price crash down. No, you don't deserve to be like that, okay? So it is good for you, it's good for me, it's good for our future generations that the world from the United Nations floor UNFCCC, United Nations Framework for uh, this, uh, what do you call it, uh, Framework Convention for Climate Change. It gave birth to several protocols. Now it is the agreement. And next time it will be when big, so biggest oil company uh, in the private sector, international oil company, uh, so they are now thinking about carbon capture and sequestrations. I have done tons of research as a research engineer, not on my portfolio, but out of my interest in 2000, 2001, 2003, before coming to America on that. This is, people are looking for an umbrella when there is a rain. So umbrella will protect on your head. Why don't you take, design a raincoat which will protect your whole body? Why don't you design a raincoat which will keep you comfortable, not sweating under the raincoat, okay? so. Skies is open, the whole world is coming behind, but government can only promise and they can take this idea on that idea, but we should be able to give the right directions from academic things. I am talking to SPE also. I talked to uh, Dr. Now the chairman is Thomas uh, Tom Blassingame. Uh, he visited uh, my University of Texas Tech at the time, and I was the graduate uh, seminar professor the coordinator, I invited him. So I had friendship with him and I talked to him about this job loss, you know, why SP cannot do something to create a business model, to help create a business model, you know, so that the students and you know, our graduates, young and old ones, do not have to be laid off. They are not laid off in the uh, government owned national oil companies. Why it happens over here? There is something wrong, as wrong as uh, flaring the gases because of lack of you know, ideas, what I call fossilized ideas, you know. And, and also the academia, they have a moral obligation in the Western world and most of the world now, they take tuition fees from students. But knowing that students may not get a job or if they get a job, they may be laid off. So I talk to them right? and it seems the one voice is not enough. There are ideas, so it is better that we go through the United Nations way which is now being enforced, and it is not there to kill us. It will kill those who have fossilized ideas, who cannot think beyond what they have been taught in an intellectual veil or whatever you call it, okay? If you don't like my word, I know uh, 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 this uh, famous uh, philosopher from Eastern Bor or um, uh, Noam Chomsky, I read his some of his scripts that our after the world wars, you know, uh, our system of education has, to a great extent, is just like an intellectual slavery. And I agree, being an educator, being a student, but we don't have to live like that. Just like we don't have to live only by burning fossil fuel, we can create hydrogen and it will create electricity. That is called, you know, hydrogen fuel cell. So this is only the beginning for the last 20 years. So I was thinking 
when I joined four years ago, uh, five years ago, University of uh, America, University of Russell Kaima in United Arab Emirates. At the point, I was the uh, first uh, official chairman of the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering. So for the first time, I had some flavor of chemical. So I thought maybe our chemical professors need to think of that instead of oxidizing gasoline or diesel, whatever, if there's any other way to find that energy from there without creating CO2, and now the world has done tremendous research. Not now, long before, but it didn't become commercial for whatever reasons. Obviously, you know what it is. You know, so if uh, you live in Egypt, I, I know most of you are from Egypt. If there is, you know, like a prophet Yusuf or Joseph, and he has a benevolent pharaoh or pharaoh or king, everything goes well. But if in the next generation comes the Ramses tree or whatever it is, the opponent of Prophet Moses, then the story turns down. The good they try to, you know, rest of the message is clear. So now the whole world is united, and America has also joined uh, recently, and uh, and uh, our combined efforts through exchanging ideas will bear fruit. So. If you're a petroleum engineer, feel good about it. Uh, you know you're going to be renamed as geo energy engineer. If you're a mining engineer, feel good about it. And in 2002, I was invited to write a paper for uh, give a presentation at Indian Institute of Technology, you know, IIT, Kharagpur, uh, about they had an international conference. So I gave the suggestion that why don't we use our directional drilling and multi-branching drilling technology for coal gasification. They accepted it and uh, and the coal gasification, you know, all those things everywhere drilling is needed and the chemical engineers, their expertise in converting hydrocarbon to hydrogen and then hydrogen to electricity, our, you know, these electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, everyone. So in the university, instead of having uh, those different department departments, it is fine to teach with the, uh, upgraded curriculum, but also that should be hub. They call the energy uh, research center. Every university, I have seen one in University of Texas Austin. I have seen one in Stanford University. I have seen one in Colorado School of Mines. I have seen one in University of Pittsburgh. Uh, but still, you know, maybe the wall has been broken. Uh, and they have made uh, uh, good things, but the petroleum engineers need to come forward because the world energy by nature or those who don't believe in religion or by God, he kept energy, you know, in a portable energy in the form of solid coal or a liquid petroleum or gaseous in a clean burn, you know, uh, compressed natural gas or LNG underground for us. We know solar is there every day, but we have not measured to make it as a sole source of energy. So we need to join hands and heads and our minds, exchange ideas, kick out the idea of patenting, no, it will not work. Believe me, within that framework to work it, I was asked to patent my invention 2010. I didn't. I said, first let me do it, take it to the field. And you bring your fund from somewhere. Some big companies came, but they came with their mindset mindset, which is called fossilized mindset. You don't have to grow yourself with fossilized ideas. And I hope uh, I have put a video over here, uh, uh, several other videos, but this is uh, what happened. Uh, and I spent several months and there was from IIT, you know, Kharagpur, my classmate in mining, he, be, he, he has become the chair of the mining department. He invited me that he has invited some, all the in, you know, top engineers, top institutional engineers to, uh, to talk about this. And that was probably in September. And then I learned it was like a, this uh, uh, kind of meeting through uh, this uh, uh, Zoom. There was only one thing done there. Blame, 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 blame. The chief speaker was one professor from Assam, my senior at Indian School of Mines, I'm not going to name, 
Uh, he's in our professor in Canada. And later on, he called me and same thing story. Who is to blame? I said, come on. If, if a little baby or man has fallen into a well or in a sea and he doesn't have to swim, don't blame him. Who threw him? Find a way to rescue him. So this is, then I started igniting, this ignited my mind for one more time. And out of there came this concept. And I thought it is time to share with, I could not have done it without the help of Pio Petro. So thank you, Pio Petro, for connecting me to the world. I really mean it. And I'll do much more than this, okay? So with this, uh, I dedicate discussing emergency shutdown system concept to you, not to any person, young energy engineers of today and tomorrow. Develop and deploy the system and pass it for the benefit of peoples all over the world. Yes, for that, you need some money. And nowadays there are even this crowdfunding, make use of crowdfunding, five of you, 10 of you join together, make a small private company, you know, like I have created over here, it's called Asan Energy Services as a consultant, but to give, but to take, okay? Of course, somebody wants a real technology development, they have to pay small money for the equipment, that is, but otherwise I'm not like others. So do it. And my best wishes to you all that you have a better career. And believe me, career you have to make for yourself and make for the next generation. Don't wait. Someone wrote on the LinkedIn, can, this is my story. Can someone please find a job for me? I understand the helplessness. We have a mouth to feed. But then, you know, we, if, we, if we join the head together, then ideas and make use of the IT revolution in terms of crowdfunding and connecting, well, well, we can do so many things. My time is almost over, but whatever I, ideas I have from my innovative minds, that you'll give birth to many ideas, which will make the world I have behind much better, inshallah. And tomorrow, my topic will be, again, another very interesting topic, and that will be about how we can almost stop this unwanted methane emissions from whales, okay? So that's a huge amount is gone there. And the main idea will be, we need to replace this old 200 years old cement port by another, which just came 20 years ago called geopolymer. And the other thing is that to maintain the leak proof, you know, uh, uh, to create, not maintain, to create leak proof, all these casings, okay? That's called metal to metal technology. This is an update, you know, heads uh, up, they call it, tomorrow, and you will see this, you will see again and say, how come we didn't think about it? So I remember my last point, one anecdote, when I was a research engineer at Pink Path University, those brilliant 16 years, uh, and uh, helping solve Saudi Aramco through the sponsored projects. So I had uh, also asked uh, one time that, can you teach a, one uh, section of building engineering? So I was happy. And uh, since then, uh, drilling has always remained with me. And one Saudi student, junior student, asked me, Professor, you're teaching casing design. Still, still, still. Why can't you use aluminum? And do you know why he asked the question? Because at the first class, I always say to my students that please don't hesitate to ask questions. Your questions are never dumb. So many students don't ask questions because they think others will love. The professor will look down at you. This is dumb. No, I say your questions cannot know. Better. My answer could be dumb. Be, uh, my professor, questions are questions. So he asked me that question. I thought, Wow, I have never heard about this aluminum casing pipe. And it is not. And I was almost going to say, how come you ask this dumb question? If it was useful, they would have done in America. That was in 1998. Thank God, I didn't say it. I said, I heard, oh, question cannot be dumb. I said, this is a good question. Let me find out. I have not seen anywhere yet. And after a few years, I found that 
some companies are making aluminum alloy pipes. Now, tomorrow I'll tell you, we can go much beyond that. This has come only from the last 15 years. It's called carbon fiber uh, thermoplastic composite. One company yesterday asked me, what is that? Can you? So there are some companies that make it. It's 20 times stronger than steel, stainless steel. It is lighter, much, much lighter. And believe me, we can do so much thing, not only cement, replaced by geopolymer or something better that you will make, okay? This is pure science, okay? Not uh, any fantasy. And uh, we change the melted to metal seal, okay? Bismuth and iron seal, we'll talk about it. Ultimately, that's not the end. Don't facilitate your mind. Oh, the world will go for LFTS. No. The next big thing is already in the horizon. It's called carbon fiber thermoplastic composite. Thermoplastic can be many things. It could be Teflon. It could be any other thermoplastic. It means high temperature plastic. Uh, Teflon is that white tape the plumbers use to seal the trade, okay? Every day uh, we use, that is called Teflon, 600 degrees Celsius. So, uh, and one company, uh, and that company website is, is called Magma Global in uh, England. And I feel very good. They put in the website that we, kept, uh, we came out of the mindset they have developed a technology and they are putting that as an offshore marine riser, okay? One reel contains 6,000 6, meters, 6 kilometers long, and they are good for carrying hydrogen also. When we talk about hydrogen, we have to carry it through a pipeline and keep this in mind. And keep this in mind for the next generation of oil or gas wells or uh, geothermal wells, okay? And the current projects on geothermal are all still, still and still, and wait for surprises. I want to be hooked up with you through this wonderful technological Zoom. And for that, thank you, Corona. Without Corona, Zoom would not be there. We'll be all slaves in the classrooms, homework, exams, and lots of uh, coffee before exams at American University of Russell Khaima. I exempted you. I said, you should sleep well. Everything will be done in the whole semester. Your homework is no homework. I do one in classroom and do the next part using this simulator, all the software packages. And they should do it. When they go home, they don't have to think about huh, homework. It is already done by the end of the day. So all this is possible if you don't keep your mind fossilized. Thank you very much. I am really grateful to you again, all of you and the audience. So please make use of my remaining years on planet Earth, which I am to see without this and with the new ideas, I am only giving maybe some spark and it will make the whole thing out of it, okay? And my journey for knowledge and work I've given over here. So there is nothing much to say, you'll see it. This is the first thing I saw as the first engineer. I said, why you are burning? And I told you the story, my pipe is small. Why you could not think better than that, economics? Those are bad ideas. Whether they're taught in London School of Economics or Harvard Business, they're bad, as bad as it could be. The mind looked up, served some vested interest, whatever it be. Now we know they have stopped going because, because of wall pressure from United Nations, FCC, slowly they are coming to look for other alternatives. Thank you very much. Uh, Rahima, I'm done. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Rafigo. Uh, thank you so much for this informative session. We really enjoyed it. And now I'd thank like you. to quiz you with the questions of our audience. Please, please go ahead. So, my first question is, nowadays we have BOP can handle over 10,000 PCI. Is it possible that we still have more blowouts and more accidents? I think it's really happening now. It's a question from our audience. It is a beautiful question. I like it. And I anticipated this. BOPs are fantastic. They have become high tech. But again, everything has two sides. 
pros and cons. Okay, the pros, the cons, the pros are of this here. They have they have annular preventer to close around the drill pipe, and they have had uh, uh, the the pipe ram to close around the pipe again. You know, without, uh, with the metal to metal seal. Then they have the shear ram, beautiful triple layer of safety, but they need attention, maintenance. The way you see they're being loaded and unloaded from huge trucks must thrown away as if it is a piece of dead body, okay? Or whatever, even dead bodies get more respect. It is precisely lack of maintenance at this time, which will mention they don't work, okay? So uh, one problem is the complexity. Complexity. In BV Macondo, basket failed and then there's a bad practice, whatever, I don't want to go into it. BOP is good practice, and my system, I don't ask. So maybe after 50 years, BOP, those big structures will be gone because of the super efficiency, double barrier, casing, emergency shutdown system. But for now, until it is proven, you know, and all are agree, it will remain there. I love it. Only thing I'll request, Please, oil companies, don't blame. Make sure that just like a fire extinguisher. Who will say that we don't need a fire extinguisher in every house in the labs? But if you see, it is a life. It needs maintenance. So if it doesn't work, it is because the human error in negligence. So it's a beautiful question, but don't rely on that. This uh, they put, and then they spend millions of dollars to develop other bigger, you know, BOP stake for South surface wells, and I was laughing at the time. Guys, what? Why cannot think something outside the box? Now I hope this will go to all wells. Well, you know this uh, double barrier. You know, I, I call it semi-autonomous. Uh, you know, casing safety valve. Semi? Why? The surface one you pull by hand. Don't try to put there any hydraulic because when there's a fire, system will fail and you are like that bit. Keep them hand operated. That's simple, as I've shown you. But the surface one will be hydraulic pressure control. When it will burn off, it will automatically close. So it is semi automatic. So, beautiful question. And look, stay tuned. Maybe in another, it depends on how fast you act on this system. 10 years, DOP will be obsolete. Uh, not with bad intention, but thank you very much for your service. But now we have something better. Like our telephone has gone, our camera has gone, everything has come to one <laughs> this mark home. And there are many other examples. Uh, so similarly, it will go. Uh, God willing. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering our question. Another question is, does the ball valve work efficiently more than the ramps of the lower BOP? When will explosion lead to damage the drill string? Okay, so you have seen everywhere is, I have watched, seen that Bagzan, you know, blowout or gas or blowout in Eastern Assam, my home state in India, where I was born and raised uh, and educated. So I was, all the videos of the legendary in Nepal, uh, this adair, it used to be called red adair because of the red skin, because of the, the heat. And then this uh, other uh, in Libya and other places, I've always seen that they can do it because the production casing is still there. They only do some cutting to place other wheel head, and that's a so difficult do job. Only daredevils can do it. I said, hey, if the casing is there, just below the casing, casing ball will also be there. Okay? So think about it. And I put one more. I mean, that there will be one subsurface. It will cost only a few thousand dollars, not hundred thousand dollars. So we have one at the surface. Casing is there, it's over there. The BOP is still there, not working. So they cut the BOP, which is malfunctioning, and, but that bulb will remain there, okay? And suppose, as you say, that there's an explosion when the whole casing is gone. No problem. This hydraulic line will also go, and it will that will trigger, that will automatically fail safe ball valve or paper valve downhole. 
let's say if it is surface casing, uh, uh, subsurface uh, casing safety valve, then it will be maybe 1,000 feet. If it is production casing, maybe it will be 10,000 feet, no problem. You know, they put lots of hydraulic lines nowadays in called ICV, inflow control valves. Lots of them coming from the deepest part. So one single, one additional, there are 20 already lines. One more quarter in size, still, still, I know what I'm talking about because that's what I used to address with the TN Hopkins uh, tubing strings in Bombay Offshore Project. Oh my God, muscle power, you know? You have to keep and then put a strap, every joint, all the way as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, the, the drilling engineer is lowering down the tubing, the tubing at my instruction. If I say stop, stop, slow, slow. And then we know. So one more line will come and only for a few thousand dollars, this will be wonderful thing, okay? Like a life boy or a life jacket that saves the whole thing. And so it is a good question, but after you review uh, this, uh, and of course you'll think, and I ask you to think, and always think, you know, outside the box, uh, don't, oh, so and so, my professor said it is impossible, keep it aside, you will think your way, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question is, the incident of deep water horizon in 2010 taught us to add more BOP valves to encounter safely the sudden pressure increases during the deep drilling. How can SCSSCSV be integrated in the configuration of the present BOP systems, especially the new trends start focusing uh, more on the digital transformation alternatives of drilling operations, like such as IoT deployment, and on the expense of mechanical alternatives? Okay, again, it's a beautiful question. There is one trend which I call the fossilized idea. They want to put one more. Suppose you're going to fight in a battlefield when there any enemy side has a gun. Okay, let's go to, I know, 100 years ago. And you are sending your fighters with sword. You say they have 10,000 soldiers with gun. Oh, we have 10,000 soldiers with swords. Let us put 20,000 soldiers with swords or 50,000 soldiers with swords. Do you think you can win? No, they'll shoot all 30,000 of you. So here, only maintaining one gigantic BOP subsea 10,000 feet of water was not possible. And you add one more, the horse cannot carry two persons on its back. You're adding one more? This is my analogy. So I don't blame because that is the only they can think. And now has come this proven technology, sub surface control, sub surface safety valve in tubing string. I'm putting it in casing. Everything remains the same. So this is the simplest, most elegant thing that can ever happen. And I don't take credit. I said, hey, why don't you use it? So those who suggest they are those big investigation committee, they will call in a few engineers who are old dogs, you know, and take their opinions and then write those recommendations. So those reports that come from, you know, uh, this, and with due respect, I'll need to buy a big trash, uh, what do you call it, a junk uh, a trash can to put them. Because fossilized ideas, they have done that. So I said with due respect, because I don't blame you, what are the gone things. So I'm opening the new horizon to the current generation young engineers. Okay, so I can bet on this. And not because, because it is already proven, just using it there, okay? As simple as that. It will work as long as you know what you're doing. So, for example, in a big companies, they hire for some political reason, the government's engineer, not train them. And instead of me in the Bombay High, you know? So I found before me, my first experience was they were pulling the rig crew on a jack-up rig, 
And it was started from the United States of America, Gulf of Mexico. It is called Bonito, Bonito One, you know? And all American uh, crewmen, you know, tall. And I, as a small guy, fresh, you know, and because they could not, my previous team, we are called a well commission team. So we go for 14 days, 14 days go, and the other people, five of them, they come back. So they put two hydraulic packers, like Camcom company, hydraulic packers. It's not hydraulic line. After you send and the keeping string those packers, then you drop a ball, it goes and uh, it gets lost inside the packer, to close the tubing port, and you pressurize through the tubing string. And that pressure opens up the uh, uh, the uh, pecker uh, uh, element and those serrated or uh, this mechanical jaws to engage with the casing. So they couldn't open it because that hydraulic pressure we put to the pipe, you know, it creates a shear pressure stress on some shear pins inside. The shear pins are calibrated; they are made of brass. So when the pressure exceeds certain pressure, they share up and then they get unlocked. So the packing element expands. They could not. So, and one of them was set, the other was not set. So they had to pull it out, but at the time, uh, because the one which was set, uh, you know, uh, it, they took 300,000 pound of force to pull through drill pipes, not giving. And the whole jack up rig was shivering like this. And when it was pulled out and we opened it, we said, during shipping, they put steel shear pins so that they don't open. So before we put them, we take the steel shear pins out and pull those brass shear pins from the box. This guy, I don't know what happened. He forgot to do that or he didn't know about it. You see? So now, this, if this thing, same thing happens with the subsurface safety valve, surface control, it is hydraulic line, and at the top, it has, uh, what do you call it, uh, those uh, in the tubing hangers, donuts, and the Christmas tree, are all greased in tripping. If you don't remove all the greasing, and I could do myself, lots of cotton rags, and clean everything with gasoline, you know, so that those, Grease do not close the ports. So this is as good a, a, a device is as good as you put attention to its proper, you know, implementation and its maintenance and upkeeping. So, so it is the man behind the machine. A rocket will fail if the or the plane will fail if the pilot uh, doesn't know his job, you know, or the doctor if he's trained in some banana republic. And he does your open surgery, you know what will happen. So it is all up to us. But comparing machine to machine, yes, this will be much safer than this blood preventers. They are humongous, they need huge this uh, pressure multipliers become you know those row red boxes. All those things will be gone if you just extend extend this current set of uh, Art, surface control, subsurface techno, you know, safety valve to casing. And what you put in drill pipe or the Kelly's, Kelly Cox, the same ball valve. If you put, you know, just below the blue art preventer on the casing head, bingo, you're good to go. Okay. So, what's that video which uh, didn't go well for this network? Obviously, I understand bandwidth problem, but that video. You could not watch, please do watch it. And I picked the idea from there in the year of COVID when the Bagjan well number five was going on like hellfire and all the experts in the academia, they were playing a blame game. At my home, I ate the good food cooked by my wife and I ignited my mind. I said, hey, here is the clue. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much for answering our questions very, with uh, special attention. We really appreciate it. And um, okay, and we can't wait to see you tomorrow for our second lecture. And uh, dear attendees, please do not forget to finish and submit the quiz before deadline. Moreover, you can watch this lecture again from Paya Petra's YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Professor Rafigul, and stay safe, everyone. Yeah, one more thing, may I request? Please tell the audience sure. that question number 20 is sure. very important. There is no right and wrong. If nobody writes anything, I'll keep minus five. If you write something good, you get points. If you write something I will not like, I'll give you points. But <laughs> if you don't write anything, minus five. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Thank See you. you. Have a good day or good night everywhere. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. And uh, I hope uh, you would like uh, to sh share your ideas with me. And I request you share my email also, my first email address. And tomorrow, uh, I'll talk to you and you'll see me. Thank you very much. Thank you very Bye -bye. much.